should I go this way or this way? And I sure don't need some stuck up thing to tell me. If you're really saved, you wouldn't have a struggle. It's because I am saved. Say there's a word for your situation. Amen. And God has given my leader a word, and we thank God. And to Bishop Morton, we say, just keep on doing the will of God. Amen. We need you, and we need men such as these great men and great women all around us. Now, I want to go into the book of Romans, and uh, I, I want to go to Romans chapter 4, verse 1 through 7. And I would like also to, to read the portion of text in Romans 4 that Paul quotes from Psalm 32. So actually, we want Romans 4, 1 through 7, and we want Psalms 32, 1 through 7. Uh, and I want you to fasten your seatbelts for a little. It might be bumpy on takeoff. <laughs> but I think it'll smoothen out uh, as we go. Amen. Uh, help us tonight, Lord. Help us. We need help. In Romans chapter 4, Paul reaches for Abraham as an example of justification by faith. And what Paul does in the book of Romans is he, he opens up with the doctrine of condemnation. And he points his one barrel of the shotgun towards the Gentiles. And if the Jews in Rome were particularly happy about that, then he pointed in chapter 2 the second barrel of the shotgun at the Jewish Christians. By chapter 3, he has concluded that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But now he's not cutting like a mugger. There is a man I went once and I saw, I was in the gym working out and I saw a fellow, he took his shirt off and I saw a horrendous scar from his neck to his belly button. And I thought immediately that had to be some cataclysmic kind of a cut. And I said to him, uh, what happened to you? And he said, I had open heart surgery. And then I said, oh, I understand. There's another fellow who was laying on the moor who just had a two inch cut under his fifth rib and he was dead. Now he just two inches and he was dead and the fellow had uh, 18 inches and he was alive. And I discovered then that some people cut to kill and some cut to heal. And so after Paul had cut them, uh, yeah, uh, uh, touch somebody and say, sew me up after you cut me, please. You know? uh, and so, so after he declared all have sinned, he moves from the doctrine of condemnation to the doctrine of justification. And now he proves his point as he deals with Abraham. He says, what shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believeth God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now Paul slips into Psalm 32 and he quotes David. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they 
whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. <sighs> Glory. I would that we would read Psalms 32 and indulge ourselves a little deeply, more deeply into what David said. He said, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputed not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no God. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. And he paused. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. And he thought about it. For this shall everyone that is godly pray. I have a problem here. We're talking about sin and the forgiveness of sins. We're talking about confession an acknowledgement of wrong. We're talking about pain and guilt. And then he says in verse 6, for this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Can somebody say amen? Sometimes it's difficult to take any text at all that relates to being in trouble in the church. But we'll take it tonight. Look at someone and say, I messed up, but I won't give up. Look at somebody else and say, messed up, but don't give up. <sighs> now, a couple things in passing. Most of us enjoy more than any other portion of the Bible, the Psalms. I think I would be fairly accurate to say that much of our Bible reading time, except for those, of course, who, who, who are professional, we, we work this thing and, and we, we squeeze it every Saturday night, trying to find something every Sunday. But most of us who just read very comfortably and very relaxingly, we have a proclivity it's simply to turn to the Psalms. Because somehow the Psalms represent to us the kind of attitude that we can identify with. It's not heavy theological philosophy. We, we don't have to search out any systematic theology writers and, and study through Jürgen Moltmann and Tillich and work hard through various other great minds, Shedd, and, and we, we, don't, we don't have to do that. We just, we just immediately just blend into the attitude of the psalmist. We, we just go straight into it. Why? Because here is a guy who can just, uh, here, you know, can just righteous people, godly people, who can just say, look, I want my enemies dead. <laughs> just, just waste them. You, you, you see, uh, somehow, uh, when you read it, you can just be real. You can identify with, with, with godly people who, like Psalms 88, the guy just sits there and just goes down the line about how unhappy he is 
with what's going on in his life. And so we can identify quickly because immediately it, it, it reaches us and it blesses us. I will follow this thing that's ticking right here. Uh, so now, it's, it's, it's interesting that, that the Psalms carries a certain, certain comfort with it. It's, it's extraordinarily comforting because it's real. It's, it, it's, it's hard to be comforted by people who are not real. It's, uh, it, 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 it's, it's difficult to be in the house of God wondering if you're the only one struggling with something it's it's you know it's it's like you know everybody seems to be so righteous in here and i'm supposed to have the holy spirit myself but it, i'm struggling with some things and i'm trying to overcome it, it's the church has become the last place that you can walk in and say I have a problem. Oh, I feel God in here. Uh, people will sit and look at you as if, if you have a problem, you are in the wrong place because none of us in here have any problems at all. We are all holy. We are all righteous. We all dress right, look right, act right. And even when we're angry, we don't even show it, you know, because church people don't act like that. And, and so right away, it becomes difficult to identify with church folk because they have this attitude that they don't have a problem. You know, can you imagine the, the, the person just coming off the street who, who, who walks into this culture shock of righteousness and holiness and, and, and then all of a sudden somewhere in the line, down the line, somebody lies on you. I mean, just one of these real righteous looking holy people just tell a bald-faced lie and right away you come to the reality to understand that everybody is struggling with something you know I feel like having church in here tonight uh, touch somebody and say he's talking to real people tonight so uh, you might as well just get out of your robe get off your collar and just understand that everybody is struggling with something. Uh, now, I, I want to go further to simply say that God can handle sin, period. Everything about this book, everything about what we believe, and the reason we're in here tonight is because we know that God can handle sin. I don't have to hide it. I don't have to act like I'm not struggling. I don't have to play the hypocrite. I can be exactly who I am when I walk into the church because if there's anything that God can handle, God can handle sin. Oh, God, I feel it in here. He can deal with you being wrong because he met none of us when we were right. When he met us, we were all. Amen. Uh, 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 and it's significant here. And I won't deal with the, with, with the textual analysis of the Psalms, uh, but we know that David is qualified in 32 because Paul says it is. But I want you to see now that the intense arguments of justification that Paul is presenting is, is to prove then that God is not moved by works. It's that God has to initiate his contact with us and it is God who is the one who chooses us and not we him. I've heard of unwanted pregnancies, but I've never heard of an unwanted adoption. If, if there's an adoption and God adopts us after we're born, then he knows the trouble we are going to be. Now, I want you to understand that. Uh, he knows the mess. That's, that's why when God gives gifts, the gifts and the callings of God are without 
repentance. Now people will tell you if you don't use it, you lose it, lying, because you know you'll still have it, and you'll be judged by having it and not using it. But you surely won't lose it. The, the reason you won't lose it is when God decided to give it to you, He already knew everything you would do with it. Uh, he doesn't get new information. Nobody instructs him. Once he meets in his C-O-U-N-C-I-L and decides his C-O-U-N-S-E-L, he gives you what he's going to give you, and it doesn't matter what you do with it because if he were going to take it from you, he wouldn't have given it to you in the first place. He had all the facts. I want you to see how significant it is that it's God who has to initiate salvation. Paul makes that very clear, and so he proves now his argument of justification by starting with Abraham. I, I want you to fasten your seatbelts here now. It's going to get rough. When he starts with Abraham, he uses Abraham as the father of our spiritual, that's our Jewish a Christian experience and he points out now that Abraham was not justified by any works he was justified simply by his trust in God and then he moves now to quote David why David by any stretch of the imagination David stirs us to a greater degree of intensity when we deal with a man who has two sides. On the one hand, he is a man after God's own heart. And one of my friends describes uh, being a man after God's own heart as somebody who pursued God, somebody who went after God intensely desiring for God to make him his bosom friend in relationship. One who praised him and worshipped him and wooed him and soothed him and sought him in the midnight hour in the morning just I want to get close to God now my interpretation is a little bit different from that my point of view is this that David was extraordinarily forgiving and merciful so not that he was pursuing God per se but his heart was similar to the heart of God when he could have wasted Saul he didn't do it I want you to note that when he could have wasted Nabal he didn't do it he was he, he was forgiving he was the one who said touch not the Lord's anointed and do his prophet no harm and David had already been anointed to take his place but he was merciful merciful I'm going to the mountain just stay with me yeah. But now, here is a man after God's own heart. On the one side, he was so wonderful, but then on the other side, he was outrageously sickening. Oh God, I propose that there are two sides to you sitting here looking at me right now. Uh, on the one hand, you can get high in the spirit and feel the anointing of God moving into the very depth of your soul. But on the other hand, you can be just as evil as anybody that I know. Just, oh, you look so wonderful, don't you? Just so sanctified. Because in your spirit, you can achieve great heights by faith but God does not disconnect us from our flesh in order for us to walk with him oh I know it's going to be rough but it'll get better if you just stay here if you just admit the truth sometimes I have wished that the Bible would go away uh, maybe it's just me now but but I don't know but I have just wished sometimes that God really wasn't as serious about what he said because on the one hand I want to do what's right 
On the other hand, something goes to pulling me the wrong way, oh God, and I end up with a struggle instead of just sweeping through where God would have me to go. I would like to ask a question. Is there anybody in here who does not struggle to do right sometimes? Oh God, sometimes you sit there and you cry and you beg God to help you in the midnight hour because you know if you pick up the phone, it's all over. If I just, I, I better not pick up this phone. I better, oh God, I, I better leave it right there. Some, Sometimes, sometimes you beg God, Lord, just, you got to help me tonight. You got to help me with everything you got. I know I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I know the power of God moves in me. But there are times I wish the Bible would just disappear. Oh, God, I feel it in here. Somebody will tell the truth tonight. Sometime I feel like I'm going to burst if I don't tell somebody a piece of my mind. Saved and sanctified, but you better not come up close to me right now. I want to talk to somebody in this place that's real. I'm, I'm sick of talking to folk that's stuck up and won't tell the truth. They, 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 There, there is oftentimes intense contradiction in each one of us. By faith, I'm hooked to God, into my spirit. But the walk with God is so intense because he does not disconnect me from my flesh. The war in my mind is what my flesh is speaking to my mind through its contact with the world. And my faith is reaching into the spirit of God and he's speaking to my mind through my spirit. And I'm caught in between, wondering should I go this way or this way? And I sure don't need some stuck up saint to tell me if you're really saved, you wouldn't have a struggle. It's because I am saved. I, I feel God in you. Don't sit down. You just you sit down. Sit down. Please. Please. <laughs> It's because I am saved. Uh, oh, there was a time in my life there was no struggle. I just did whatever my flesh said. But since I've got the Holy Ghost, I got to fight back. I don't feel God in this house. Don't sit down. I, I, I won't keep you. Oh, Lord. You, you, you've got to understand this. That, that even, even, no matter how high you get positionally, there is always an intense struggle between what's spiritual and what's carnal. I thought about this generation curse. It moves through the flesh. It moves through the world and the contact. And the world has access through our senses. If I just didn't see that, if I just didn't smell that, if I, if I just didn't touch that, I think I could make it. But, 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 but I'm touching and I'm smelling and I'm seeing and I'm hearing. And, and it's putting something in my mind that's warring against my spirit and I'm caught in an intensity where I'm saying God disconnect my flesh I used to pastor in Texas and when I was in Texas a lady came to me and said pastor I'm single you know I've been single this many years and, and, and I'm sort of struggling here I, I, I need you to pray for me that the Lord would just take these desires these, these libidinous desires out of me I said alright I'm getting ready to pray but now if God God sends you a husband, will you be back for me to pray that he put it back? <laughs> uh, no, no, you know, my second prayer might not be as powerful as my first prayer, honey. So you just ask God to help you while you're going through the struggle. <laughs> I don't know myself preach like this here. Uh, you can be so wonderfully good 
and find yourself in a battle for life because you can get into something in 15 minutes that it takes you 15 years to get out of oh god i feel it here oh, the lord is my shepherd i shall not want is david's good side but Uriah and Bathsheba is David's bad side. Oh God, I feel the Holy Ghost in here. Uh, if you're holy tonight, you ought to be praising God. If you got through that last hurdle, you ought to be giving God the glory. And if you messed up, don't give up. Get back up and tell the devil, you thought you had me. But I'm coming out by the power of the living God. I want you to see that God then does not hinder truth from us. It would seem to me that if David was a part of our entourage, we would do our best to cover his behavior. Oh God, uh, but God does not cover the behavior of anybody who is significant to him. He does not cover David's behavior. In fact, not only did Israel know it, but we're reading about it some 4,000 years later. Now then, I have to do this. I have to do this. When I read through the Psalms and I see David and I and I marvel at his, 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 his grandiloquence, I marvel at his anointing, his creativity, his, his ability to talk to God. I marvel at the power of his strength. And, and I look at David and I say, David can preach to me. Uh, I like David. He, he can talk to me. Yeah. But then I turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. Uh, and then I read the man's behavior in 12. Uh, and I said, my God, is this the same man? Because most of us were raised in environments uh, that if somebody ever came up wrong, uh, they would be stricken from our list. We would say things like, oh, he couldn't preach to me. She couldn't talk to me. You can't talk to me. All that mess you made and all the stuff you went through, you'll never preach to me again. And when you hear certain people are coming to town, you don't even go there because you know what they've been through and you know what they did. I want to ask you another question. Have you stopped ready reading the Psalms after you read 2 Samuel? I mean, after you read David and Bathsheba, did you turn your book from the Psalms and say, I will not read David anymore because of what he's done? Now, oh, I feel like preaching now because anytime the preacher's on you, you, you get quiet. So here we go. Now, let's me say this. Let me bring a child to talk to you and see, could you listen to their preaching? I've got news for you. My life is so complicated that I need somebody to preach to me who has been to hell and back. I need somebody who's been through something to get up and tell me how God can bring you out. If you've never been through anything, you're not qualified to talk to me. I need somebody that's been close to the edge. I feel the spirit of God here. I need a David to talk to me. I need a Peter to talk to me. I need somebody that's almost threw it away because I have felt like throwing it away. I need somebody who's been to the edge to tell me God's got the power to bring you back. If you mess up, don't give up because the power is in the hand of God. I feel God in this place. David's good side and his bad side. His good side was when he told the story of the man. His bad side was when he would take a man's wife standing on his rooftop instead of being somewhere fighting as leader of the army. He's standing 
on the rooftop relaxing, he ends up calling the woman to his house who actually has no power to tell him no. He is the king. How many times have we been pulled in by the stronger personality and we end up getting the blame for what stronger personalities do to us? Oh God, can I preach like I feel it? Matthew would not even mention her name in the genealogy. If you read through the genealogy of Matthew, when he gets to Bathsheba, he says, her who was the wife of Uriah. Come on, Matthew. If I know her name, you know her name. Come on, put her name out here. Come on, man. Don't act like that. Oh, God. He didn't even want to touch her name. Uh, you sisters, help me now. Touch your sister and say, sister, we get a lot of blame for what men do. Um, I'm gonna have just a little church tonight. You, you've gotta understand this. That he pulled her by the strength of his personality. And when he got word that she was pregnant, he sent for Uriah. Because he figured anybody who was out there with the proclivities and the tendencies of a man like me would come in and go straight home. But Uriah stopped at David's house, would not go home. Now here is David, who spared Nabal when he protected his goods, and Nabal didn't treat him properly. Here is David, who would not kill Saul, who was trying to kill him. But because he didn't feel like God could deal with his mess, he decides he'll cover it himself. I wish I had a church that would make me feel like when I'm wrong, I don't have to get worse. But I can come just the way I am and say, before I mess up anymore, I need somebody to help me out of my situation. I feel like preaching in here tonight. Pull on your neighbor. Say, you coming out tonight. The real you coming out of here tonight. We're not going home with any hypocrisy. We're going home delivered and set free from the enemy's hand. Oh, David. This man David told you, right, go home. And he wouldn't go home. He stayed there and when he got up next morning, he was there. Then he gives him a letter. Now he's using his loyalty against him. Said, take it to Joab and when you get there, when you get to Joab, give him this letter. You and I would have read it. I would have opened it myself because I would have got the rumor he was going with my wife anyway. And you know I act on rumors. I wish I could preach to you. Folk will hate you with speculation. And God will love you with the evidence. Oh God, I feel you in here. Oh God. Oh, I'm here to tell you. Here is the man. And they say, leave him in the front and back off him. He ended up killing this man and taking his wife. Now here is the bad side. He'll commit adultery and murder. Here is the good side. When Nathan comes to him and tells him the little story about the man with the ewe lamb, David said, if he took the man's ewe lamb and fed his visitor with all of what he had, that man shall surely die. That's David's good side. Even when he's wrong, he's sensitive. Oh God, I wish I could preach it. But then here is his bad side. Thou art the man. Oh, can you see what Paul is doing? He intensifies his argument on justification by pulling up David. And what he's trying to show us is there is no glory in the flesh. 
because Abraham sinned less viciously than David but don't fool yourself the father of the race himself was not justified by works but by faith tell somebody I'm not here by behavior I'm here because I trust God I don't go to church because I was so good I don't go because I am so good I still believe the text unto him that's able to keep me from falling and present me with all of my mess faultless touch somebody's hand it's going to happen because no matter how I mess up I refuse to give up oh God I feel a breakthrough coming notice the text if you will he uses according to the flesh in contrast to according to the spirit and what it does is it refers to the department of our being from which springs works in contrast to that which springs faith whenever Paul is speaking of the relation of works to justification he never uses dia or by means of he never uses through but he uses out of because the Jewish faith thought that the meritorious source of salvation was one's works God didn't choose me because of my behavior he chose me in him before the foundation of the world which means that he put his hand on me in spite of what he knew I would do because he has the remedy to make me right I can't make myself right but God can make me right and when folk can't make you right God can make you right and you must always look to your future and never to your past because the reason the devil brings up your past is because he can't do anything with your future oh god i feel your power in here and so now he says abraham believed god and it was counted unto him as righteousness the problem now comes with the it the it in that verse and that is now what does the it refer to is it a question now of one god's righteousness being freely given to the sinner or is it that God made Abraham righteous on account of the merit of his faith is he righteous because he believed or is he righteous because I gave him righteousness do you see where we are there now if you look at it from the whole book of Romans you will only conclude that it could not be the second it's got to be the first because he's proven all guilty of sin all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God so now if God made Abraham righteous on account of the merit of his faith then we're saying it is strictly and entirely a work and as such his faith would be the efficient cause of man's justification but that couldn't be because it was not the act of believing which was reckoned to him as a righteous act or on account of believing which perfect righteousness was laid to his charge but when he talks about his faith he talks about Abraham trusting God to perform his promise introduced to him in the blessing that he said was coming in other words when I come to God I come as I am this is me but I come believing God I don't have an act of faith that God regards as righteous but I come trusting God with all of my weaknesses with all of my fleshly proclivities with all of my bad record just let me in the church because I believe if I can get in the house that God will bring me out 
Now can I take it a little further? He's had an attitude of trust in the acceptance of God's blessing. And that made it possible for God to bestow righteousness on him. Faith is simply the bridge that God moves over to deposit the righteousness in Abraham. Faith is not the cause. Faith is just the bridge. How might I put it? If a man is drowning, I'm drowning, and I stretch up my hand and somebody catches it, is my stretched out hand the cause of my being rescued? The answer is no because a whole lot of drowning folks stretched out their hands and nobody was there to save them it is not my stretched out hand that saved me it's the lifeguard that caught my hand my hand was just the means by which I could be saved but it did not save me how might I put it here is a woman on the house top and the fire is raging on the house oh god and the firemen come stretch out the net and say jump if the woman jumps did the jump save her no the jump didn't save her the firemen who caught her saved her the jump was just the means by which she could be caught when you mess up don't jump back into the mess but jump into the hands of the Lord who died to save you I got news for you touch your neighbors and neighbor if he died for you he'll kill for you too I feel like preaching in here tonight if he died for you he'll wipe the devil out of your face and give you power to get back up and stand where you ought to and that's why the writer declares give me just a few more minutes I'm through that that imputation it's God who imputes or puts righteousness to our credit sometimes while I'm in the house of God and he realizes the struggle I have he deposits righteousness inside my spirit and puts it down in me and gives me credit for a behavior I don't deserve because he sets it in my account notice in the text it's not a reward because if it were a reward it would be dues paid for work wages and I have not done enough holiness to deserve the anointing of God that's why you don't let folk mess with your faith because guilt and faith don't go together when folk make you feel guilty it stops your prayer life because you feel like I don't deserve to ask God to help me because of the things that I'm struggling with but that's a lie child because nobody deserves for God to bless them anytime I heard the Bible say it's my father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom to somebody say I messed up but I can't give up I gotta wait on the righteousness that comes from God I feel the Spirit of God in here tonight put on somebody say neighbor you can come out of it God's going to take you out of it don't sit here and die but rise up and tell the devil I'm coming out of it he says it's not a debt because if God owed it to me then it couldn't be grace because grace is not a legal debt but grace is unmerited favor and that's why when I come to God I don't ask him for justice I ask him for mercy I feel the Holy Ghost in here because sometimes I feel so sick of myself I feel like throwing in the towel but something on the inside says the same God that brought 
brought you out of darkness into this light. He can deal with anything that comes his way. I want to talk to some preachers in here tonight. Don't give up. Too much has been invested in you for you to walk away because you messed up. I feel like preaching in here. Come on here, Johnny. So I can preach like I feel it. I heard David when he came out of himself in deep repentance. He said, I suffered in the night because of my guilt. And I felt the pressures of my spirit all through the night. But I'm so glad that you deposited some riches in my account and put righteousness in me. Can I preach? it like I feel it. Sometimes the Lord has to cover you while you're struggling with something. I wish I could talk to some real people tonight. I think we could get a breakthrough in here if some folk would just admit that sometimes God has to cover you so your enemies can't find you when you're struggling with something. If my enemy could find find me while I was struggling he would destroy me before I could recover but I thank God he knows how to cover every one of us struggles because if the saints could see you in the middle of your struggle they would turn on you that's why he covered you because he knows this time next week you will be delivered but if they knew even when you were delivered they would never forget it and always talk about it so he covers you while you're struggling every now and then he'll check you out with a move of the Holy Ghost he'll tell you did not tell you never leave you, nor forsake you. I'm still here. I know your flesh is weak, but I'm depositing. Touch somebody say, thank God for my last deposit. I've been drawing deposit. Then what he'll do, he'll strengthen you, he'll wash you, he'll fortify you, then he'll pull the covers off and let you tell it. When I was down, you thought I was up, but God held me together in the power of his hand. preaching in here. Give somebody a high five. Tell them don't give up. There's another deposit coming. Don't give up. He's getting ready to pick you up. Don't give up. The deacons will get over it. Don't give up. He'll fix the world for you. I feel it in here. The psalmist said, thou art my hiding place. Have you ever been hidden by God? Has he ever hid you in the cleft of the rock? And when the devil tried to get you, he stood in the path, said, I know he's weak, but you ain't coming in here, because I'm getting ready to give him a double anointing. David said, take my job, take my car, take my house, take my land. But one thing, don't take away, don't take me a whole spirit away from me touch somebody say you can have my house you can have my car you can talk about me like a dog but as long as I'm still anointed I won't give up I'm coming back up I feel the Holy Ghost hold on somebody tell them you're coming out man He's gonna bring you out of that mess. If you hold on, he'll bring you out.
bring you out. He'll turn it around. The psalmist declared, you compass me with songs of deliverance. Everywhere I turn, you brought me out. When I lost my mind, you brought me out. When I lost my money, you brought me out. When I could have messed up, you brought me out. When they had me cold, you brought me out. Turn around one time. Say, everywhere I turn, there's deliverance. Everywhere I turn, there's more joy. Everywhere I turn, there's a way out. Touch somebody. Say, neighbor, don't give up. I don't care how you mess up. Don't give up. There's too much invested in you. I feel like we're Tell somebody, don't give up. You're close to the edge, but don't give up. You came to the meeting to get some strength. Don't give up. Don't resign. Don't walk out. Don't leave. Hold on. I feel an anointing. Hold on. I feel him picking you up. Turning it around, shake three hands. Say, hold on, I feel a double anointing. Hold on, he's getting ready to strengthen you. Hold on, he's taking you higher. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah. Lay your hands on somebody. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Hold on. Hold on. I feel like preaching in here. Come on, preachers. Run down here. Lay hands on somebody. Somebody in the crowd. Feel like giving up. Come on down here. Come on down here. Come on down here. You better hurry up while the anointing is here. You can't give up. You can't give up. Tell the devil, you thought you had me, but I'm getting away. I shut up. I'm feeling it here. Lay hands on somebody. Three minutes, and then we're through. Three minutes. If you're coming, come on. Break up in here. Run up in here. In the door, you can't give up. I shut You can't give up. You can't give up. Help me, help me. You can't give up. You can't give up. You can't give up. What's wrong with you? You can't give up. You can't give up. I am a shot. You can't give up. Never. 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 You can't give up. I don't care how rough it is. You can't give up. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. You can't give up. You can't give up. Trouble may come. Trials may come. Heartache may come. Weeping may endure for a night. But shout. Shout hallelujah. Tell the devil I won't give up. I won't give up. God in this house. Touch three people real quick. Say, I messed up, but I can't give up. I can't give up. I'm moving into my best season. I'm getting ready to move into my best season from trial to joy, from fighting to refreshing, from struggling to releasing the power of God. I refuse to give up. I refuse, I refuse, 
give somebody a high five and say, don't 